we will be uh, gladly accepting all other participants coming later. Uh, and I'm really happy to announce that we are ready to start our school skills of the future. We are ready to start um, our School. Skills, skills of the Future of the is an international uh, online uh, educational uh, project in Belgium that, that starts yeah. today and will finish <clears throat> next Saturday. And I really hope that uh, by the end of next week you will get a lot of new knowledge, uh, new contacts and new network, and um, a lot of uh, overarching uh, understanding of how this wor world works, how uh, professional projects are done in international context. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all the partners and all who made this school possible. Uh, first of all, uh, this uh, school uh, is possible thanks to a grant from the National Agency of Youth Affairs um, that made it possible to organize this school and see you all today. And also, I would like to first of all say a few words about the partners who organized today. and co-organized with us uh, this school. Um, by the way, my name is Antonia Nikromika and I will be here with you uh, throughout the whole program. Uh, and uh, among our main partners, I would like to name, uh, first of all, Skaltech, uh, which is a top leading university offering master level programs on a wide range of technological programs. And you will uh, have a chance to talk about um, this university, to talk about the uh, educational projects uh, and programs that we have there. Uh, secondly, it's uh, MedInvest Group, which is an investment company leading projects in the sphere of medicine and oncology and medical facilities. And those of you who are participating in a medical trap uh, will get to know more about this organization. Um, then it's Schiffer's Institute, which is a <clears throat> educational consultancy forum uh, working on top level educational programs and different project methodologies and um, I hope that after uh, finishing this school you will know a lot about um, how to make projects, how to make pro pro uh, professional projects um, and what it means to implement a project either in the sphere of medicine or in space. Um, <clears throat> another partner of our pro program is uh, Project Movement. Uh, which is a countrywide community of technological enthusiasts. And I know that some of our <clears throat> participants uh, are deeply involved with this community and um, have done a number of uh, inter interesting technological initiatives with them. And last but not least, our partner is Kayen, which is a market leader in Russia in online education and uh, language learning courses. Um, I would like to say that uh, this school is really an experiment <clears throat> Uh, because we and our main mission and um, our main position is that we truly believe that young people need a platform for professional cooperation at very early stages of their career because most of you are going uh, to the university so are either planning to go to university uh, this is where you get professional education but at the same time we <clears throat> truly believe that there is a need for space and platform for young people to get practical hands-on experience in different uh, technologies where they can understand how uh, to work and how to cooperate in their uh, semi-real world environment. Um, and also I would like to say that uh, another basic principle of this program is project education, uh, uh, which means that we uh, <clears throat> not only discuss things or give you some knowledge or give some lectures, uh, but we prepare some practical tasks uh, where you get to know experts really working in uh, some of the fields, uh, working in science or in industry um, or are entrepreneurs, and you really uh, get to know them and you get to work in this uh, environment. Um, I will be talking today about the organizational moments and how the uh, program is structured, but that will be a little bit later. Uh, right now, I'm just uh, happy to say that we will be working uh, the whole week, uh, starting today on Sunday and finishing uh, on Saturday. We will be working the whole day on the weekends, so that means that we're starting today at 10 a.m. Moscow time, and we will be finishing at 6 p.m. Uh, the same thing about the next Saturday. Uh, on the work days, we will be working for four hours on this Zoom, but that doesn't mean that you're limited to only those four hours. Uh, another organizational thing I wanted to tell you, maybe some of you uh, haven't um, understood it yet. So we have two separate tracks. 
Uh, one track will be working on medical projects. Uh, the other track will be working on space projects. Uh, and they will be uh, working in parallel, but at the same time, you will be having some activities where you get chance to get to know each other and uh, talk together and um, explore what other teams are doing. Um, and probably the last organizational moment that I wanted to say at this moment is that we will have a lot of different uh, formats and uh, that's probably the only session that we're having uh, right now where I will be speaking and, and other speakers will be giving their presentations and you will be mostly listening while at all the other formats uh, we will be mostly ex uh, expecting you to participate, give your views, um, exchange your positions uh, and all that. Well, uh, by this, I would like to say that uh, my introduction, uh, I think, is over, and I would like to proceed uh, with our opening plenary session. So, um, even though I said that uh, we give such a big emphasis on the project education and on the practical projects you will be uh, implementing throughout the school, we wanted to start with a plenary session. Um, where I invited some um, experts uh, to discuss with us uh, our approach towards, uh, towards new technology, towards innovation, um, uh, and discovery of, uh, um, <clears throat> of new things. Uh, because um, I, I think that uh, today when we're talking about uh, new technologies, whether it's uh, medicine, whether it's uh, cutting edge medical research or uh, space technology. Uh, we're usually talking about uh, the, uh, the technological and engineering aspect of it, rather than discussing the uh, social outcomes. Um, and uh, what is really important and what you will be discussing through all the days of the school um, is not only about how new technologies emerge and what are new technologies, but what is the uh, social, societal uh, aspect of it and how new technologies affect our lives, affect our social organization, affect our social behavior. And that's basically the main topic of our today's plenary session um, because we will be discussing what it means uh, as making projects and that we're not talking about mastering technology, but we are talking about how social context is changing. Um, we, I hope that by the end of this school, you will also realize that the process of technology adoption uh, changes a lot depending on the country uh, which you are working on. And uh, for instance, um, adopting new space technology in India is completely different from how you uh, do new space projects in Russia. And uh, if you are interested in fulfilling some international uh, projects in the future, you have to understand this uh, country to country context and you have to understand this uh, societal change that you're trying to bring in by mastering uh, these technologies. Uh, but, uh, well, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you our experts. Today we have three speakers. Uh, the first one will be Igor Chausov, who is the head of uh, analytical division. Uh, I, I hope everyone is seeing Igor. Um, is the head of analytical division of uh, EnergyNet Infrastructure Center. Uh, Igor is a great expert uh, with a variety of knowledge, uh, mostly on engineering and energy projects. And I think he will be talking mostly about um, engineering uh, aspects of, uh, of the technological change. Um, our second expert today is Alina Markova, uh, PhD, experimental oncologist, um, a senior researcher at the Institute of Biochemical Physics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And uh, as you can understand, Alina will be mostly talking about oncology and medicine and how research affects our lives. And our third speaker today is Yuri Mladych. Um, Hi, everyone. Uh, he's a director for Technology Challenge of National Technology Initiative Fund. And he will be also uh, telling you about different ways of how you can uh, adopt change and uh, ensure that innovation really comes to our lives. Well, so I would like to uh, suggest that we will start by short presentations of um, all of our speakers, starting with Vivid. And then um, I will start some of the questions, but we will be gladly um, accepting questions from the audience. I would suggest that you write your questions in chat, but uh, if you also have a, would have certain questions, you can raise your hand. And um, 
as usual, I'm sorry I didn't uh, introduce the uh, <clears throat> the ways of communication. We suggest that you keep um, your mic off when uh, at the times that you are not speaking. But if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, so, you did please. Uh, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you much. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, do you hear me now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks a lot for possibility to be a speaker today. Um, I will speak about the uh, maybe well-known uh, trifecta for a project, uh, trifecta diagram, and uh, make some uh, examples, some cases for uh, how this um, idea of uh, three key uh, points for every project uh, works in uh, reality, how it works in the past, uh, how it now works in... Um, uh, some architectural projects and um, how um, did it uh, make some projects um, uh, feasible and uh, make it reality uh, in uh, modern um, uh, architecture and uh, uh, urban culture. Uh, so first of all, uh, the main idea of um, uh, my today is uh, this uh, diagram. Uh, trifecta diagram for a project uh, that uh, means that uh, in every project if you are uh, going to make your idea uh, real uh, you have to work with uh, three uh, bets or three uh, key points uh, and uh, the well known is the idea of feasibility uh, is it feasible is the project feasible and uh, engineers works with uh, different technical aspects for it, so um, it's maybe the most um, easy to make something feasible because today science is um, so developed that uh, maybe the magic is real too from the uh, point of view that engineers could uh, make um, every type of uh, decision and we know that uh, there are a lot of uh, science and engineering ideas that are um, uh, something from a uh, very, very future. So, the, uh, maybe the most complex part of this uh, diagram are the two other uh, points. The ability and uh, desirability. And uh, where, when we are talking about the viability, we are talking about the canonical bed, uh, a bed that uh, this idea could make some, how we know it uh, called, uh, uh, a unit economy. Uh, so it's um, idea of uh, that every project should make uh, some business model. Uh, that makes uh, it real in the um, that real economic um, context where this project would work, and these economic projects, uh, this economic point could be sometimes something about the uh, market, how it will work on the market, with all the points about this uh, unit economy, or sometimes uh, it uh, could be the uh, governmental type of economy or planning economy because uh, sometimes uh, the project uh, should work with the governmental insurance uh, systems or non-governmental insurance systems should work on the very very long um, times and uh, sometimes it is not the question about the market sometimes uh, much more important how it works with the um, all the macroeconomy, uh, how it works with the um, governmental currency, uh, politics and monetary politics and uh, so on. But uh, if the project doesn't contain the idea of um, this uh, business model that uh, makes it working with other aspects of economy, with other aspects of um, economical relationships, uh, in all the aspects of this uh, project, this project will not be realized, no way. But the most, most and uh, the super uh, important uh, part of project is the, uh, that it could be desirable for people. It's 
a social bet and it's a social aspect of project uh, because if it is not for people, if um, nobody wants it, no, nobody will use it. Um, if it is uh, something from uh, the type of future that we um, don't want, or sometimes uh, if it is from um, too far uh, future for people, it will not work to. And this is very interesting uh, aspect because uh, we all think that um, it is part of economy, but not that way. Um, it's not the answer the question, will it be um, buy? Uh, will it uh, be buy on the market? It's um, uh, not about the money and uh, consumerism, it's about the uh, some value that it could bring to, uh, to society and this value could be uh, understandable for this uh, society. Sometimes something that you could um, uh, solve is not the thing that will be used and uh, that's why if your project is for a long period of time, the only market idea <coughs> is not enough for realization. You could realize it on the stage but this project will not lead on the old life side that you are thinking about it when uh, it was project and when you are trying to relax so some cases uh, to um, make examples for this uh, um, diagram and for these ideas the first is from the aviation it's from the past uh, uh, why the Soviet project of uh, uh, supersonic jet uh, uh, that was uh, called the uh, Tupolev 144 um, doesn't work as the um, useful uh, supersonic jet system. Uh, it was very interesting and brilliant by the technical uh, aspects. It was uh, very fast for even for supersonic uh, passenger, uh, passenger jet, um, but uh, we had only a few uh, flights of this uh, aircraft type. Uh, it was something about maybe uh, one and a half hundred uh, of uh, flights for all the life cycle of this project uh, with uh, passengers and um, the other very. Um, well-known project of supersonic jet is um, Concorde, the British-French uh, um, supersonic jet that um, made, I think, something about maybe uh, 10,000 of uh, flights for its uh, life cycle. And uh, the idea, uh, the main idea is that the first wasn't economy enough and the second was but it's not the reality uh, because um, the Soviet supersonic jet uh, was uh, economy enough too or we could say that uh, Concorde wasn't economy enough because all these types of flights was very very expensive for passengers and uh, this uh, problem of expense was decided by different ways in Soviet Union or in uh, the capitalistic economy of uh, commercial flights in uh, uh, USA, British and French and uh, uh, so on. But the main was um, the very interesting uh, um, sum of technical aspects and uh, social aspect and uh, aspect of um, economy that in Soviet Union we hadn't uh, the system of uh, operation and maintain for this uh, supersonic jet, 2.144, uh, and uh, it was uh, such an interesting that all the operation and maintain system was a laboratory system. The only way was that uh, pilots uh, for this uh, jet was from the uh, 2.0 firm, uh, they were very, uh, very um, 
overeducated pilots uh, from the uh, um, army, from the air force, and uh, from the um, experimental flights, because all these um, Tupolev uh, jets was very very complex for the pilots, and this was the first. Uh, reason and the second was that uh, the operation and maintain system for this jet wasn't uh, for the uh, commercial or just for the um, uh, simple economy, it was for the warfare economy. Thus, it wasn't scalable. And the Concorde was. Uh, Concorde was very, very expensive, but it was scalable. For uh, thousand flights and for uh, hundreds of planes that was uh, constructed and was uh, operated uh, in the 98s and 99s. And now it's a very interesting question: uh, Would the uh, supersonic jet return? Uh, this is the the. Uh, bottom picture about the uh, well-known project that called Boom. Uh, it's an uh, American project uh, about the how to make the supersonic uh, aviation resurrection. Uh, how could we uh, make it uh, not just visible enough, but also uh, a return to this uh, diagram, the ability by all these aspects of uh, economy, how make its uh, operation maintains him as a commercial him. And the second is uh, how make it desirable for people because Concord life cycle ended when the desirability of this project ended. So in the first case uh, about uh, why should we think about the uh, not the only idea of our maybe plane or uh, maths or space system satellite or uh, a data um, operation system or something else. We should also think about the operation maintain system about the all the life cycle how it is organized, uh, how it is um, uh, constructed by the engineers and uh, engineering, uh, social and economy aspects, and uh, how could we make the idea of our project and uh, our decision simple enough for this very, very um, simple world where the scalability is one of the main uh, aspects of uh, realization for uh, every project. We shouldn't uh, think about the project that's, that's something that will live all the time with, with us, but in this uh, case, the most interesting thing was that uh, the uh, Tupolev supersonic uh, jet was uh, something that could live only uh, in uh, um, limits of uh, Tupolev car. Okay. So, second, uh, very interesting uh, cases uh, from uh, we call the Finnish sauna because it's a real sauna, but it's a sauna on the uh, artificial islands, and it's a um, uh, project of this uh, year that was uh, made from Carlo um, Ratti uh, Associati, a very famous uh, Italian design bureau and uh, architectural design bureau. Um, it was an interesting competition uh, in uh, Finland, in the Helsinki, how to make um, a heating system for the Helsinki uh, green and cheap. How could it be uh, based uh, on the renewables and uh, how could it be uh, net zero and uh, cheaper at the same time. So the Karolata Society uh, made a very interesting uh, idea where you could uh, see how feasibility, viability and desirability is uh, uh, connected by the maybe uh, fantastic way. Uh, they decided not to make uh, some um, 
simple and uh, maybe uh, well-known types of uh, feeding system. They decided to make an artificial island uh, near uh, Helsinki uh, as a thermal storage facility. So they uh, proposed uh, that uh, renewable energy that are near Helsinki and uh, in Helsinki will be stored as a thermal power in uh, this uh, artificial island that's called Port Hub. And then this uh, heat power will uh, go on to the existing, uh, existing uh, heating system of uh, Helsinki and on the base of this uh, artificial island they constructed the um, idea of uh, uh, special garden, uh, summer garden and uh, a lot of uh, Finnish saunas uh, on the base of this uh, renewable heat uh, to use the uh, losers for this uh, heat power that uh, is uh, um, part of this engineering system, of this uh, uh, technical system. We, of course, all the time have some losers of uh, energy when we are working with the uh, heating systems. And they decided to make these uh, losers uh, uh, desirable. And uh, this idea of how to make something very um, simple, not by the simple way. Let's do it by the most expensive for the first uh, for, uh, view and uh, let me make it from the most complex way. Let's build some island. Okay. But this uh, very interesting is to read the data um, uh, sheet for this uh, project because it, um, it, it, it proposes 10% uh, decreasing of uh, um, uh, cost of uh, heat energy for Helsinki from the existing one. And uh, it's a uh, net zero. So, that project is. Uh, 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 have won this uh, competition, one of four projects that won this competition that uh, we hope, well hope that it will, will be uh, realized because it is very, very interesting how it will work in uh, uh, reality and um, if you will read about this uh, project um, on the, this competition website, there are all the economics and all the technical engineering uh, aspects, uh, all the calculations for it is uh, published. Uh, you will see that all these spec uh, aspects, feasibility, availability, and desirability is uh, uh, interconnected in this uh, project uh, by the Canada. And the last uh, case that I want to uh, show you is a biophilic case uh, it, uh, from the Carlo Ratti as a chapter 2. And uh, it, it, it is the um, uh, joint project of Karl Rati Asociati and uh, Bjarke Ingels uh, group, uh, the famous uh, Scandinavian uh, uh, architectural design bureau that called BIG, Bjarke Ingels group. Uh, Bjarke Ingels is one of the most uh, famous architects of our time that all the time realized some uh, mad ideas for the um, uh, buildings and uh, this uh, project is interesting to me because it was realized. Uh, it was uh, uh, finished by the construction and by all the works uh, maybe a month ago uh, in uh, Singapore. Um, so it's it, uh, called uh, the biophilic uh, carburetor and this uh, biophilic carburetor that uh, was constructed in the downtown of Singapore uh, in the business uh, of Singapore. It is interesting because the idea of this uh, building is to make it uh, net zero, of course. All the things today are net zero or try to be net zero, but uh, the most interesting part of this project is that it is sky raper and uh, a vertical garden in uh, one case. So it was very interesting how they uh, decided to make the uh, building um, 
emptying the center of it and to organize the uh, vertical uh, garden for all the people who would go to this building or who lives in this uh, building uh, in the center of the skyraper. So the skyraper is not something for the commercial, uh, not only for the commercial uh, areas, uh, and it's not about the square meters uh, and how the square meters could be uh, sold for, ma uh, for maximum. It's first of all, is about the problem of that uh, in, uh, the Singapore doesn't have enough uh, area that doesn't have enough uh, square meters as a city for forests and gardens. And uh, that's why they decided that uh, the garden should be inside the uh, building, but not the building inside the gardens or building inside the forest that uh, um, every time uh, uh, um, try to get some area from these uh, gardens and from these forests uh, of uh, the last part of natural Singapore, last part of not artificial Singapore. So they uh, connected this uh, to uh, part of desirability, square meters for living and uh, square meters for gardens and forests in one. And uh, it's very interesting that they realized this uh, by, by only the um, commercial money without the city or government uh, um, uh, joining in this uh, project it's only for um, the, uh, the economy the viability of this project is uh, operated only by the commercial sector uh, it is for living and for uh, some business uh, areas uh, for some commercial areas uh, for shopping and so on uh, so the uh, I've I read the feasibility, uh, part of the feasibility study for this project, the uh, rate time, uh, if it is uh, three years, for three years, it will bring all the, all the money that was invested in this uh, case. But the m most important and most interesting um, aspect of this project is that it is very, very desirable for all the Singapore's who will not pay for it. It's not the, um, you know, uh, there's no tickets for this uh, guy. So, uh, in the last uh, case that I wanted to show you, and uh, to some, the main uh, diagram that I wanted you to use in your project is this uh, trifecta diagram and uh, think about the viability of your project on all the life cycle and about the visible aspects on all the life cycle, not only for the project that you made. Uh, not only for the uh, technical decision that uh, the second is that uh, sometimes uh, the uh, most cheap decisions are uh, the most complex decision and sometimes if it is uh, mad enough it will work but if it's not mad enough it will not work. and the last is that uh, think about the desirability think about the point that we are now living on the age of plastic economy and uh, going somewhere to the post-capitalism and in post-capitalism the desirability is very very important to uh, make um, your project something that will lead for a long time thank you for your attention thank you very much i think it was a wonderful example of the fact that an engineer has to understand what is post-capitalism and that you cannot be successful engineer without understanding how society works uh, and now let's get to research, because I know that the medical track uh, guys are probably thinking what it has to do with them. Um, Alina, please tell us uh, a little bit about uh, how research is being changed today um, and how, how we see a person at the center of the research. Uh, we don't hear you. I think your mic is off. Uh, I think your mic is still off.
Okay. Say something, please. Yeah, yes, yeah. it's my turn to, to speak. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, okay. Um, um, I would like to tell you about uh, the quality of life of cancer patients. Uh, I'm Adina, I'm a molecular oncologist, uh, uh, and uh, I work in a science in crossing of chemistry, biology, and uh, uh, quantum physics. Uh, and uh, I'm sure I'm interested in medicine, but I'm not a doctor. That's why my, presentations, uh, my presentation will be uh, from the point of view of some persons, some researchers uh, who is making uh, my research, uh, trying to uh, make uh, some practice technology, but I don't work uh, with uh, patients, uh, that's why. But uh, I try to focus on the uh, issues and uh, uh, problems uh, which uh, are excellent for patients. Um, I'm working uh, uh, in course of chemistry, biology, and physics, uh, and uh, um, I, my research is about uh, the palliative care of cancer, and uh, um, in some cases, which is which, which is, it's necessary to find the less uh, dangerous way for patients, for example, in cases uh, about pregnancy and cancer. Um, I work uh, with uh, photodynamic therapy method. Um, it's, um, I think I think it uh, it's not a good idea to comment all the detail of these methods, but, uh, but because I would like to uh, uh, to show you the whole picture. Uh, but uh, I will recommend this uh, scheme. Um, uh, the photodynamic therapy combines um, the uh, chemotherapy and uh, laser irradiation. Uh, if cancer cell um, uh, is treated with a special molecule photosensitizer, and if it uh, was irradiated with a laser, uh, the physical chemical photochemical reactions. Uh, acts to the formation of uh, reactive oxygen species, which are very cytotoxic and which can uh, uh, be the main uh, reason of cell death using any mechanism, using necrosis or apoptosis or autophagy or necro necroptosis uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, this time, this method is uh, dependent on the amount of oxygen into the cells or uh, into the cell microenvironment. Uh, and it's very uh, important to treat um, the uh, it's very important to use this method in cases when uh, the, there is a sufficient amount of oxygen near the uh, cancer. Uh, but uh, there is some cases when cancer cells are very aggressive and uh, when uh, oxygen dependent methods like PDT or like radio sensibilization or like some types of ke uh, chemotherapy does not work because uh, uh, the oxygen is uh, a very important condition for a lot of uh, approaches in cancer treatment. Uh, that's why uh, uh, I uh, try to to increase the boundaries of usage of uh, photodynamic therapy uh, to hypoxic tumors um, uh, using uh, some gas transport formulation of photosensitizer or for this uh, chemical uh, drug uh, which uh, uh, converts the light energy into the uh, chemical energy uh, and uh, uh, we make uh, some emulsions with photosensitizers to make uh, to um, satisfy the uh, 
as a cell with oxygen uh, and uh, to have uh, uh, some period for making our oxygen dependent procedures. Um, sometimes, uh, yes, to do it, uh, we've used uh, fluorocarbons. So there is an interesting chemical uh, class of liquids uh, uh, which uh, can dissolve the oxygens uh, 10 times more than water and um, this strange picture with red, it's not my uh, red and it's not my picture, but uh, this is uh, the strange demonstration of liquid uh, breathing and uh, you know there is a lot of side effects and I think it's not optimal to realize the mm. idea of project using this uh, picture. Uh, but uh, it was published and I can uh, make a link to it. Uh, but uh, at this case, at this demonstration, me as a, a researcher can uh, um, note that uh, it's not optimal way because uh, it <clears throat> excludes uh, the red reflexes. And it's, uh, it's, it's about the very bad quality of red's life. Uh, and, but I'm working with cells and uh, I'm... Um, far from medicine and I'm far from uh, practical usage of my technology. That's why I can only think about it to com and communicate with doctors. And I would like to tell you about the whole story, the whole picture. And I, I prepared three cases for you to understand the uh, importance of uh, thinking about quality of life of patients instead of only uh, Five, year, five years uh, survival interval, which is uh, which we can read at a lot of protocols and a lot of researches. Um, um, I um, I would like to tell you three short, short stories uh, about my colleagues who are medical. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, was about my neighbor when I was prepared my when I was preparing my PhD thesis. I was living in the dorm with my, in the dorm with uh, a radiotherapist, uh, and she told me there there is a very strange behavior of a patient, a forty years old uh, patient uh, with a difficult type of lung cancer, uh, refused the treatment. They refused the radiotherapy and uh, uh, started traveling, started having some bases, started uh, smoking cigars, started uh, uh, drinking rum, and uh, after the finish of his travel, uh, uh, there was no way to help him instead of uh, use a lot of analgetics to. Uh, Help him, help him to overcome his pain, and uh, he's dead. But, uh, and he preferred the quality of life instead of in the, uh, invalidization. Uh, in uh, according according to the cancer treatment, very difficult procedure for him, and uh, according to cancer rehabilitation, it was his choice, uh, and uh, I could understand his choice. Uh, the last case will be about uh, that radiotherapist. Uh, mm, she was making a procedure for five year young lady uh, with a uh, very difficult form of leukemia. Uh, they made uh, the radiotherapy procedure uh, and uh, it was uh, her fourth radiotherapy after the courses of chemotherapy, it was very, very difficult and very cruel and serious case. Uh, and uh, during this procedure, uh, the young lady told her mom and told the doctor, I understand uh, that you want to help me, but there is a New Year's Eve. We we'll like New Year. And I have a wish. Please, buy me a bright pink lipstick with gold shimmer and please teach me how to use it because I want to be a princess at this, this new year. Sure, they bought it, they did, 
adopted and she was a princess and after the one the two years she was a princess uh, at new years but uh, now she's not still among us and i have a good story for you with a uh, happy end but i can't say that it's the end uh, but uh, this happy funnel uh, nowadays uh, this is the story about um, my colleague uh, who was she was preparing her PhD thesis, uh, she was my classmate uh, at PhD class and uh, uh, her research was about biomarkers of uh, uh, breast cancer uh, and uh, she made a lot of experiments uh, analyzing the blood uh, of uh, cancer patients uh, uh, using flow cytometry uh, and uh, one, one day, it was a very long experiment, uh, and uh, she lost uh, the control probe of a healthy patient, uh, a healthy human, uh, and uh, she decided to analyze her own blood uh, to uh, make a control for her, her experimental probe. So it was uh, an evening, it was a very long uh, experiment, a very difficult uh, Method and uh, uh, analyzing her own blood, her own sample, she understood that it's not a control sample. Uh, then uh, um, the diagnosis diagnosis was uh, approved, uh, and uh, she had uh, she uh, had uh, a uh, triple negative breast cancer. It's very aggressive. Uh, it's a very serious case of cancer. Uh, and uh, um, she started therapy, she, she agreed to therapy, she agreed to rehabilitation, she agreed to you know, all of this uh, very difficult way. Uh, and uh, uh, we are friends, we were talking about uh, everything and nothing, we were talking about fashion, about uh, makeup, about relationship, loves, uh, and other things. Uh, and other stuff. Uh, and she told me, Alina, I understand that I um, try to overcome it, but there is a very strange feeling inside my body. After all these surgery procedures, after all these chemotherapies, after all of these radiotherapies, really I feel that I'm like a robot and I have some problems to fall in love, I don't feel my body, I don't know how to become a woman again, and I want to be a mom. Uh, sure, uh, it was a lot of procedures to um, reboot, to reboot her uh, life and reboot her feelings using all methods, and uh, now she's a mom, uh, she has a daughter, uh, the daughter uh, does not have uh, that mutations, uh, and uh, it's okay, it's all right uh, for, for her daughter, but uh, she preferred to uh, use the donor sperm and uh, to make a call, uh, and she preferred to avoid being a wife because of her hormone problems and because of her the difficult feelings about her body and about her humanity. Um, and I uh, think she is commenting it that uh, the psychological uh, support, the sessions with psychologists uh, is uh, her lifestyle and uh, she understands that uh, it's, uh, it will be very long and uh, she likes to uh, go uh, her way at this. That's why uh, using these three examples, I wanted to uh, show you that uh, when we are talking about the quality of life of cancer uh, patient, uh, we are talking not only about physical health, we are talking about um, mental health, uh, about uh, ways how to overcome the anxiety, the depression, the psychological distresses and other cognitive functioning unstabilizations uh, uh, too. We are talking about social health, including uh, family functioning, including marital functioning, 
uh, and sexual functioning too, uh, including uh, role uh, limitation, uh, including some limitations due to emotional problems. Uh, and uh, sure, uh, the most popular uh, the most popular problems of uh, patients are uh, fatigue, problems with sleeping. Uh, uh, health distress and a lot of pain. Uh, that's why uh, this complex uh, is a standard of uh, um, calculating and analyzing and uh, trying to realize the uh, best uh, quality of our life of patient, uh, which we can make uh, can to do, uh, can to realize. Uh, and uh, it's not only about five year survival period of patients after treatment, which we can read about analyzing the data sources, the scientific articles and medical reports. Um, I would like to uh, revise you that there is uh, some types of uh, uh, some types of uh, uh, Anti-cancer treatments uh, like surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, uh, targeted therapy with a lot of uh, uh, new drugs and a lot of uh, very um, focused drugs, focused on target. And uh, uh, there is uh, the period of uh, development of uh, the immune system uh, uh, technique, uh, the techniques of immune therapy of cancer. I think you heard about the Nobel Prizes uh, uh, for these uh, applications. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about uh, targeted therapy, let's see, I would like to show you. There is a long... Uh, Maybe you could share your screen um, wider yes. because now we see... Yes, I would like picture. to do it. Sorry about it, I forgot to do it. Is it better? Or no? Yeah, but we need to go to the slide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Thanks a lot. I forgot about it. Sorry, guys. Uh, okay, uh, we have a lot of uh, drug targets. Uh, we, could, we have a lot of uh, signaling which we can use to initiate the cancer cell death, to initiate. Uh, to work with microenvironment of cancer and uh, make other uh, specific uh, ways to overcome this um, uh, type of cancer. And uh, we have uh, individual cases of patients with each individual profiles, uh, with their individual omics and uh, um, statuses and cases. Uh, that's why it's uh, very important to find uh, some solutions uh, to uh, choose uh, the optimal way for individual therapy for this uh, patient and uh, don't lose the time because uh, uh, sometimes the period for making a decision is short. Uh, that's why I think uh, that um, uh, the topic of our school, the topic of your last classes uh, uh, about precision medicine can help it, uh, for it can uh, help to analyze uh, tumor diversity and uh, heterogeneity and take, uh, tr uh, it, it may uh, help us to make uh, some uh, predictions of uh, um, the behavior of cancer cells and the behavior of uh, uh, tumors. Uh, that's why using uh, the omics, uh, the characteristics of microenvironment, uh, using the NGS and uh, liquid uh, biopsy probes uh, and um, some other uh, approaches uh, to uh, make these individual to realize these individual techniques. Um, it's it's important to find the best way for uh, cancer treatment. But I would like to remember you that uh, the 
the cancer treatment includes uh, these social aspects and uh, these uh, mental aspects of mental health of patient, patients and uh, analyzing all these methods and, and uh, making your projects or making your reports uh, on the finish of for this school I would ask you to uh, remember this case about the quality of life of patients um, Really, I uh, I could not prepare some focused examples for you about uh, the precision oncology cases uh, because uh, it's very interesting and uh, really uh, I think uh, maybe it's not the idea of my report to uh, to describe uh, this idea. Um, for you in details, but I've uh, found uh, this uh, good database. Uh, the database uh, where, where you can uh, read uh, the clinical reports and uh, uh, the cases from 2018 about precision medicine in ecology and uh, I think there is a full of information and full of uh, high quality analytics about the boundaries of usage of any methods of individual medicine and precision medicine. Uh, and uh, we'll finish, finally I would uh, tell you that um, it's very important to combine these spheres, to combine these social spheres, social aspects of uh, quality of life and uh, psychological, emotional as aspects of quality of life and uh, sure scientific, technological, uh, medicinal aspects of uh, this issue. Uh, and uh, sometimes you can see, you can know about a lot of for actions, a lot of performances and a lot of activity um, which tries which try to help uh, the patients to overcome their emotional problems and uh, to uh, realize the emotional support for, for them. But I think uh, that um, this is uh, the challenge for all of us, uh, if you are medical, if you are researchers, it's a challenge to refresh your knowledge and uh, to, ask this, to ask this question for uh, yourself ever and ever. How can we uh, um, make you more effective de decisions for uh, the quality of life of patients with cancer. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, research-oriented and yet uh, socially-oriented and um, socially important um, presentation. So now we talked about engineering and engineering aspects. And I know that the medical track people were thinking, whoa, what's that about? Then we had um, this presentation on medicine, on cancer, and this whole universe of uh, treating patients. So how to unite it? How, where does it meet? Uh, how to put it all together? So now we will uh, hear Yuri Molotov. And the key topic that we wanted to discuss with him was technological challenges. Uh, how do you approach them? What is a technological challenge? What are the key uh, internationally uh, acknowledged technological challenges? And how technology contests can help in this respect? So Yuri. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Yuri and I am a head of technology challenges in the um, National Technology Initiative in Russia uh, and uh, I would like to talk to you about um, uh, the technology contests, challenges or prizes as uh, they are called sometimes. So uh, to start with, uh, I uh, thought that a good example would be a challenge uh, which uh, was uh, held a uh, hundred years ago, uh, it was called the Prize. And um, the goal of the challenge was uh, to fly uh, a plane from uh, North America to Europe. Um, and uh, at the time, it was uh, thought as uh, feasible, but uh, very, very difficult. Uh, and so uh, uh, the price was going for eight years. 
uh, during which uh, uh, some teams uh, tried to um, uh, create airplanes uh, which were cap capable of transatlantic flight. Uh, some of them um, failed to create a, a working airplane. Um, some planes crashed, uh, uh, but uh, uh, at the end, uh, in uh, 1927, uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh, um, world uh, known um, uh, aviator, uh, managed to fly from New York to Paris uh, without a single stop. Uh, without uh, he was alone in his plane, uh, and uh, everything worked flawlessly. Uh, and so uh, <clears throat> he was the winner of this prize, and uh, uh, he, uh, it, it was a greatly important milestone in uh, aviation history. And um, when we talk about prizes, challenges, uh, and contests, um, the main idea is to uh, find uh, a task which is, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, it is uh, feasible, but on the other hand, it's uh, extremely audacious. And uh, uh, the idea of a challenge is to, um, um, to find uh, people all over the world uh, who are willing to take some risk uh, to create uh, a new technology, uh, which is uh, uh, very, very audacious. And so uh, that's why uh, when we design challenges, uh, we try to uh, look at the issues at hand uh, and um, to look at uh, methodology and uh, technology uh, uh, around the issue. And so if uh, it's known how to solve the issue, uh, it's not an issue per se. It's sometimes it's better to call it an engineering task uh, or, or uh, an engineering problem uh, because um, uh, we know how to solve it. We can find a one a good team uh, of engineers, uh, give them uh, the task, and uh, we can be sure that uh, maybe not from the first try, but um, uh, 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 sooner than later, then they will be able to um, create a, a new technology. But there are some issues which are unknown how to solve. When uh, there are lots of uh, approaches, no one knows uh, which approach uh, would work, uh, which would work best, and uh, it's uh, uh, more like a, a problem uh, with, um, uh, 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 if you take an engineer and ask him how to solve it, each engineer will give you a different answer, and so uh, when we see a problem uh, and issue uh, of this kind, we know that it's a good uh, material for technology challenge, because uh, the best way to use uh, technology challenges, uh, such as um, the previous example, is uh, to um, incentivize uh, people uh, to find new solutions and to look which solutions uh, uh, work best um, for solving the issue. Um, and uh, so, uh, nowadays, uh, uh, technology challenges, prizes, and uh, contests uh, are widely used uh, all over the world. But uh, the main um, uh, country uh, where uh, technology challenges are mostly um, uh, used is United States. Uh, uh, it was uh, uh, it started uh, uh, sometime um, uh, in this century uh, and uh, initiative on uh, technology challenges, and uh, by uh, 2010. Uh, they managed to uh, make uh, all uh, the initiatives required to make uh, it a, a big thing uh, in uh, American uh, society. Uh, there is regulation which allows uh, government agencies and um, <clears throat> organizations to spend money on uh, uh, launching prizes. There is uh, finance, there is uh, platform, uh, platforms um, of ch for challenges. And so uh, it's a big thing. Um, the rest of the world is not uh, uh, as far ahead uh, when we talk about technology challenges. Uh, there are some initiatives in the uh, European Union uh, and uh, almost none um, in the rest of the world. Uh, there are some, but uh, there are very few and um, uh, uh, they are not uh, 
uh, they are really global. Uh, so um, when we speak about uh, American challenges, uh, the participants are usually from all over the world. And when we speak about uh, other challenges, um, including the European Union, usually most of the uh, participants are from inside of the country or in case of EU, you know, are from the European Union. Um, and so um, I would like to uh, show you another case of uh, technology challenge um, because uh, the first one uh, is, is quite old uh, and um, uh, there is not much to learn uh, from the design of this challenge. Uh, but this one, I'm sorry, XPRIZE, um, it's a private uh, challenge. It was launched by uh, XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, it was going for uh, nine years, which is quite a lot by uh, today's standards of um, technology and innovation. Uh, and the goal of the challenge was to create a spaceship uh, which is able to, uh, high, um, uh, to fly twice a week with a crew of at least two people. Uh, to the space and back. Uh, and it uh, had to be privately funded. Uh, there was um, uh, um, uh, the part of the challenge was uh, that 90% uh, or more of the funding for the uh, spaceship had to be private. And so uh, in uh, 1995, uh, nobody uh, took seriously the private space uh, industry. Uh, it was not a thing. It was before SpaceX, it was before all the big companies um, which are launching um, today, you know, private companies. Uh, it was thought that uh, space is just for government agencies. And so uh, the XPRIZE Foundation, they looked at the challenge um, and they understood that uh, that's not the case. That uh, in um, 20 year, uh, 25 years ago, it was already possible, feasible, and uh, viable uh, to create a private space company. And so they thought that uh, if they launch a challenge uh, which will bring a spaceship, a uh, private spaceship to life, then uh, using the prize money, the prize money for this challenge was uh, $10 million, uh, uh, then the companies that participated in uh, the challenge will be able to find a way uh, to find uh, the financing uh, to launch uh, private space companies, uh, which would be economically viable. Uh, and uh, they, they were uh, absolutely right. Uh, the spaceship on the photo is uh, called Spaceship One, and uh, nowadays uh, yeah, it's uh, a spaceship uh, that won uh, Ansari X Prize competition. Uh, and uh, nowadays it's uh, a Virgin Galactic uh, company, uh, the spaceship and the team were bought uh, by Richard Branson, uh, and uh, it's one of the leading uh, private space companies uh, in the world. Uh, and um, of course, uh, only after the challenge, uh, other space companies, including, including SpaceX, um, started to uh, launch. Uh, and uh, so uh, this challenge is a, a great example of how a well-designed, well-placed and uh, very carefully uh, and thoroughly uh, thought of uh, in uh, context of, of sociological change uh, can change the world uh, in um, <clears throat> creating new industries which were uh, thought only as a government uh, before, uh, but uh, after the challenge everyone sees that it's uh, feasible and viable. Uh, and so, uh, I do challenges uh, in Russia. Uh, we have um, some uh, challenges finished, some ongoing and uh, uh, preparing to launch. And I would like to talk about one of them. It was our first challenge. Uh, it was called Winter City because uh, at the time it was launched, uh, it, it was designed in 2017, launched in 2018, uh, and uh, finished in 2019. Uh, at the time, um, all the technology companies uh, who were developing uh, self-driving cars, uh, they were driving in places like um, Arizona, uh, California, or uh, for instance, is Israel. Places where it's not about uh, uh, bad weather. There is no bad weather in uh, such places, uh, almost always. 
And uh, we looked at the uh, uh, companies uh, which were doing self-driving cars, and we think that uh, we, as a Russian uh, initiative, uh, we have uh, an opportunity to launch a challenge uh, for self-driving cars uh, in bad weather condition. And so we launched a Winter City Challenge uh, in which um, uh, teams of uh, participants uh, had to create um, self-driving cars uh, to drive um, for 50 kilometers, uh, it's uh, like um, uh, 30 miles um, through a city-like um, uh, road infrastructure with uh, uh, people with other cars and uh, to do it safely and without uh, uh, breaking the uh, driving uh, rules. And uh, so, uh, uh, at the time, there are a couple, a couple you know, companies uh, who are doing uh, uh, self-driving cars in Russia, uh, but um, um, uh, there is uh, Yandex, of course, uh, a big Russian uh, technology company, which is doing uh, self-driving cars now, uh, but at the time it was just starting. And so we, we saw it as a, an opportunity to uh, make, um, uh, to create uh, opportunities for uh, Russian companies, Russian universities, uh, to develop their um, self-driving cars. And so um, we we think that uh, we have succeeded with this goal because before the challenge, uh, there were just two companies with uh, real uh, working uh, self-driving cars. Uh, and after the challenge, uh, we see that uh, there were seven, uh, five of our, our finalists uh, were quite successful. Four of them uh, have uh, now um, uh, commercial contracts um, the thing about self-driving cars is that uh, they turn to be uh, quite harder than even the pessimists uh, were thinking um, uh, five years ago. And so uh, there is no company who, which has a uh, self-driving uh, taxi, for instance, which can operate anywhere. Uh, it's uh, not uh, feasible just now, uh, but uh, um, it will become feasible in some time in the future. But uh, it's, uh, it's possible to create a technology and to create a business uh, around self-driving cars. Uh, just uh, it's not general purpose self-driving car uh, to uh, be profitable. Uh, and so uh, I can say that uh, with this challenge, we uh, managed to be uh, the first in the world. Um, you see in the photo in the uh, right, uh, bottom right corner, um, it's uh, the photo of the first in the world um, uh, self-driving car traffic jam, uh, uh, and uh, the lesson we learned uh, from it is that there are some situations on the road which uh, cannot be solved according to the uh, um, driving rules, because uh, in this case, uh, uh, their cars deflow in such a way that um, uh, it was impossible uh, to um, start driving uh, further uh, without breaking um, a rule or two of, uh, you know, for, for driving. And uh, we had a problem of um, Russian uh, um, service for um, traffic control. And he looked at the situation, he called some of his colleagues, and they said, no, uh, the cars are right. No one of them can move, um, not breaking a law. If uh, we would have uh, uh, people uh, uh, behind the wheel of these cars, uh, they uh, should have uh, broken the law uh, and uh, drive uh, anyways, because uh, the, the road is there, it's, it's just uh, the laws that prohibit uh, driving. Uh, and so, uh, I would like to talk uh, uh, for a minute or two about uh, different situations in different countries. Uh, uh, when we design challenges, we see that um, in uh, most of the challenges uh, that are uh, worldwide, uh, the companies uh, participate from all over the world. Uh, for instance, uh, just yesterday, um, there was a final, final uh, uh, test, uh, final run of uh, a prize, Avatar prize. Um, uh, their task was to create a, a robot avatar. So it's a uh, control uh, which can perform a wide set of tasks uh, that uh, a human can do, but uh, most of the robots uh, can. And uh, so uh, uh, their uh, trial is in California, uh, but 
that uh, the first place of the challenge uh, was uh, won by uh, German uh, University. The second place was uh, uh, won by a uh, French uh, private company. And the third one was uh, by uh, American University. And uh, in top 10 teams, there were some uh, people from uh, South Korea, uh, from China, and uh, from some other places. So if you look at any uh, international uh, challenge, uh, uh, the participants are usually from all over the world. But if you look at the organizer, organizers of international challenge, uh, they are almost always uh, from the United States. Uh, why? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I think that uh, in the United States there is uh, a lot of work uh, done uh, to make um, uh, challenges and prizes um, popular and uh, feasible. Uh, and so um, some American agencies, uh, many of them, uh, they run uh, a challenge a year and um, everyone knows about it and there are lots of people working on it. Uh, but that's not the only reason. I think that uh, one of the reasons is that um, uh, is about that um, uh, it's very hard to launch a business, uh, a startup or a company um, which uh, operates globally. Um, but if you speak about uh, digital uh, products uh, mostly uh, uh, and uh, physical products too, but in less uh, lesser form. Uh, when you launch a product in the United States, um, it's going to be as global as possible. Uh, but when you launch a pro project every anywhere on Earth, um, it's usually local product uh, uh, for a local co country or um, union uh, as an EU. Uh, and so, uh, uh, of course, uh, in this case, uh, when um, global challenges, they attract companies from all over the world because they see that if they succeed in the challenge, uh, and it's not important uh, whether they uh, take uh, the first prize or uh, they take the fourth place, uh, but if they succeed, everyone will see that they have technology which is globally um, uh, wanted and uh, um, everyone sees that uh, uh, the business uh, can be launched. And um, the people will, will buy it because it's um, uh, seen on a global stage. But uh, when um, <clears throat> some uh, company um, in other countries uh, design a challenge or design other forms of uh, supporting uh, innovation companies, uh, you see that um, uh, the situation in these countries uh, is um, uh, they are not as globalized. And uh, when um, uh, uh, the participants of these challenges, they are usually from this uh, country because they understand that this um, uh, support uh, 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 mechanisms uh, are um, uh, mostly uh, for the company uh, members and uh, residents. And so I think that um, in designing new uh, technology, uh, it's very important to think not just about um, who will want to buy it in terms of um, uh, uh, the final consumer, but also who would want to buy it in the terms of uh, investors, uh, um, um, in terms of governments uh, and government support, uh, and uh, whether you want to take um, investment money or government money, or you don't, but uh, if you see that uh, the product appeals to uh, some um, entity, that's a good sign that uh, the product will be uh, viable on the market uh, uh, of this entity. And so uh, I think that a challenge is a good way to support some of the uh, technology innovations, but uh, not all of them. Uh, but the um, lessons we learn from analyzing uh, uh, technology challenges from uh, different countries, they are quite um, uh, transferable to other uh, forms of um, innovation support. And so I think that uh, there is something to learn uh, for every one of us. Um, so thank you for your time and attention, and, and attention uh, Antonina Batimov. Thank you. Uh, well, I hope that the projects that we will be doing um, at the school, maybe that 
won't be uh, those technological challenges and those examples that Yuri were giving, but at least we will be on the way to those cutting edge technologies. Um, I see that we're out of time, but uh, to sum up, I just wanted to ask all our three speakers who are with us today, um, could you please name like very briefly three key technology challenges or maybe even technologies um, that will define uh, our future in 10 years? Uh, and I would like to ask Igor to say about space real, space domain, um, Alina about medicine and medical research, and Yuri, it can be with respect to the technological cha challenges you're doing or whichever focus you prefer. So Igor, let's start from you. <clears throat> okay, the most important three challenges for space. Uh, the first that uh, I would like to say is this uh, challenge of uh, uh, commercial uh, space can uh, maybe something like a, a hypersonic uh, passenger uh, transport. This is the first one. Uh, the second, the second uh, challenge is um, uh, uh, a space basis, uh, basis on the satellites and uh, planets, so something. Uh, that could be operated for a long time, for years, not only uh, with some more. It is the second one. And um, the third one, I think, um, is an um, interconnected system of uh, space data for um, all the Earth uh, uh, management. Uh, I think the most important is. Uh, uh, idea that is in the uh, uh, terraforming book uh, that the space um, activity is a uh, activity to manage the planet, the Earth planet. So this uh, type uh, that is not only uh, commercial um, satellite images and uh, so on, but also something like a, a space system to um, Control and uh, manage the Earth as a system is the third main uh, challenge. Thank you. And I would say that we will address one of them in our projects with the space track. Alina, and now your turn. Uh, I'm thinking about the future technologies uh, of cancer treatment and uh, in medicine, too. I think the first point is uh, the increasing the increasing of uh, diagnostical methods, uh, the uh, crossing different methods and uh, um, combining it together uh, to make the whole picture of each uh, patient, uh, of each uh, medical case, uh, and uh, to analyze uh, all, all of these data. I think uh, artificial intelligence uh, would help uh, med medicals more and more. Uh, the second uh, trend, I think the second way it will be about uh, not only Im immune therapy, I think it will be uh, the approaches how to manipulate, how to use the uh, physiological systems uh, or mix uh, different elements, uh, how to manipulate the uh, physiological function of uh, the systems to uh, overcome uh, the cancer and other uh, pathological processes so inside the body like immunotherapy but plus some different uh, maybe hormone therapy and uh, some different uh, systems uh, and I'm thinking about bioprinting I'm thinking about the transplantation um, and um, mm, sure it's, it's very difficult to predict uh, three ways uh, uh, only three points of uh, developing, but uh, my uh, choice was about it. Okay, and we will be working a lot with uh, diagnostics and validation with the medical track students, so, um, and Yuri, what would so, you say? Um, the first one is uh, right around the corner, uh, but the progress will be very slow, um, and well, it, it won't be very slow, but it will be slower than we want it to be. 
it's uh, artificial intelligence. Um, today, we see that uh, there are huge improvements and huge uh, applications of um, AI, um, but uh, mostly uh, the methods of, of this application are very crude. So you see companies like um, DeepMind, like Facebook, uh, launching their um, uh, uh, solutions for uh, machine learning, and these solutions use huge amount of data, and they cost uh, quite a lot just to uh, train the model. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, GPT-3 uh, from OpenAI uh, costed uh, something like uh, $10 million just uh, on infrastructure and electricity to train the model. Uh, so it's not including uh, human labor and um, uh, all other expenses. And uh, this happens because uh, uh, today's approaches uh, for artificial intelligence, they use um, uh, data inefficiently and they are not able to learn from a single or a few uh, uh, trials. So, uh, and we see that a human can learn sometimes from a single um, experience a lot. And sometimes uh, he is able to learn from somebody else's experience. And so uh, we want and we will get uh, artificial intelligence approaches um, that are more efficient uh, using data. And it will be really important. And the uh, progress in this area will be uh, a little bit slow uh, because it won't be a huge a single breakthrough, but uh, a series of smaller um, improvements. Um, the second one uh, is, and all the others, uh, uh, they are not uh, happening maybe right now at the pace and scale uh, we uh, uh, see with artificial intelligence, but they are more important uh, in the long run, I think. Uh, um, the first one is uh, robotics. Uh, and we see that uh, Robotics is quite close uh, to the um, uh, technology which is able to create robots uh, which are able to do anything from mining to manufacturing to creating uh, other robots. And so robotics is a, a way uh, out of poverty for uh, billions of people. And uh, that's very important. And um, we won't be there yet in 10 years, but the progress will be huge and uh, uh, it will be possible to use robotics in many ways uh, which are today are totally not viable economically and uh, not feasible technically. Uh, the third one, and I'm with eager on this, is uh, climate change. Uh, climate change is uh, important. Uh, it has a lot of attention and uh, uh, of government agencies and investors. So anyone with a uh, technology on any stage of the pipeline of climate change control uh, can get a lot of funding right now. And uh, this funding, uh, some of it will be ineffective, but uh, it will help to get the technology uh, to become better. Um, and uh, I think that uh, medicine is important too, and uh, but uh, I'm not as competent as Alina to uh, uh, detect what is the most important around medicine. So that's my theory. Okay, thank you very much. I think we will be finishing here with our opening plenary session. I see that we're a bit out of time, but I think it was very interesting and gave you overall picture of where technologies are going, what is the importance of the um, social context of uh, technology adoption and how to take part in technological challenges. So let's thank our speakers, uh, Alina, Igor, Yura, thank you very much. Uh, and we will go into our um, next part and the next part would be uh, more about the organizational context of uh, our work, how we will be working. I will tell you a bit about um, our structure and it will take about, I don't know, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. Um, uh, okay, so first of all, I just wanted us to get to know each other and uh, I hope that you know how to use uh, Menti. Um, I just wanted you to um, answer us, what cities are you from? And just 
to get to know each other overall while we are all still together, all the two tracks. So what you can do, you can uh, go to menti.com and use the code that is stated here. And if you will be answering, we will see the new, uh, the new answers from you. Someone from the Star City has already answered, but um, I want to see. I, uh, I suppose the majority will be coming from Russia, but... Oops. I'm reloading it. And uh, for those uh, participating uh, in, 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 um, in the school from Russia, you will need to use VPN for that. Unfortunately, uh, Menti is not open anymore. Um, okay, let me, let me reload, but uh, you will see two questions there. Uh, and uh, the first one will be about where the city you're from. Uh, and the second one will be <clears throat> about your aspirations from the program. Um, uh, for, for some reason, I cannot reload it. I'm sorry. Um, so I will probably go to the next point and you guys can still be <clears throat> answering that. If we could post in the, um, in the chat, the, the, the code for Menti would be um, I would appreciate that. Uh, and I will show you the answers later. Um, all right. And so uh, the next uh, question that I wanted to discuss with you was the uh, program structure. Um, let me let me share my screen. Um, Uh, so <clears throat> let's go to the schedule. I hope all of you have already used our chat to see the schedule here. It's just the general uh, picture so that you can see, well, by, by the colors, uh, the structure of how we're working. But let me speak a little bit about that. Um, so we are working the whole, today, uh, the whole day today on Sunday from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Moscow time. The same thing about Saturday. Uh, Monday, Monday through Friday, we will be working from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, and basically, uh, where you can see uh, a program in yellow, that means that this is uh, the place where we will see all of us together. Um, and basically, it's plenary session right now. And every day from 5 to 6, we will have what we call an international club, which is actually a networking se session where we will be discussing different aspects of networking, of uh, building your projects and project presentation, on public speaking. Um, there will be another session uh, on Skoltech and Skoltech educational programs, uh, both on the engineering side and on life sciences side. For those interested in Skoltech, uh, there will be a number of our interesting uh, initiatives and international projects that we would like to share with you. Um, and also we will see the final defense. The final defense, uh, please save the date right now, will be on Saturday from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, that's where you can you will see some of our uh, experts you will be meeting, you started meeting today and will be meeting um, up until the end of the program. Uh, and then uh, the, the program you see in blue and in green, that means that you are working uh, in your tracks. So basically you're doing your project work. So that's the main um, part of the program. Uh, and if you are considering uh, and having difficulties with your schedule, I would uh, much rather prefer and I would recommend you not to skip your uh, project and your track sessions, though we're asking you to be present at all times, of course. Um, and so for for the space track, so right after this session right now, we will distribute into two um, groups, into two rooms. One will be space track and the other one will be um, medical track. Uh, but just to give you a brief information, uh, mo most of the time, uh, both tracks will be working separately and you will, will, you will be having a number of different educational formats. Sometimes it will be lectures, uh, like the a medical track will now start with the lecture and uh, space track will have two 
uh, two sessions, uh, two, two, two uh, lecture sessions today. Um, in other times, you will be working in teams uh, with our moderators, and they will be uh, presented, and you will get to know them uh, better once we um, separate into different tracks. Uh, and um, depending on the number of participants, we are planning to have about four groups for each track. Each of them will be addressing its own aspect of uh, the projects. It's either space economy, space technology, space policy, or uh, different medical technologies that you will be exploring and making your research on. Um, and so basically today it's mostly introduction into your um, uh, into your uh, track, but uh, also please keep in mind that uh, the program is really intensive. It's uh, only one week. So today you will need to start and you will need to have most of your uh, research and background research done. Of course, you will have some more time to get back to it. Um, afterwards, but uh, that's that, that's the main uh, timing that you have. Um, uh, if you have any further questions or you want to consult with the program, please take a look at it and th there will be much more details if you look at um, each section of the program. <clears throat> um, now I wanted to get uh, to get to the question of how do we get in touch, how do we communicate. So I hope that now everyone is in our Telegram channel. Um, if you are not, please uh, join us. Uh, it's really simple. It's International Space Medical School. Um, and uh, <clears throat> many people in our team are already uh, communicating with you there. Um, now you can also um, uh, participate, uh, and if you have any direct questions you would like to ask, you can always uh, contact with us. So uh, if you have any general questions about the school, uh, that you can contact me. That's um, the first contact here. These are all contra uh, our contacts in Telegram. Uh, if you have questions about related to the medical track, um, I would like to introduce you to Anastasia Rgachova. She's here with us. Um, as if you're here, just wave so that people can yeah, see you. I'm sure, I'm sure they, um, they, they, they will see you, but um, just for the sake of time. Then if you have any um, uh, questions about projects, about uh, our general uh, program and all things like that, uh, this is Valeria Denisova. Valeria, also, if you could greet all, all the people, I'm sure you will get to know her, but so that you know who's working with you. And also, we have our community manager. Which is, this is uh, Olga Travnikova. If you have any uh, questions related to, I don't know, some technical issues, something um, that you need to um, do and you don't know how, what's the best way, or you lost your group or whatsoever, you can always address to Olga. And also, we are expecting you to organize chats for your project groups. Um, and here we don't limit you anyhow, so you can choose whatever means of communication you prefer. Um, so the, the, these are the main um, communication channels. I think that's it uh, that I wanted to say on the organizational side of things. Um, yeah, I talked about communication, I talked about schedule, uh, I introduced you most of our team. Uh, well, so I guess we can finish here with our uh, main opening session. Um, I see that we need to go to the groups, but uh, I just suggest that we have a short break so that we can be redistributed in groups and we will go there at 11.15, which gives us about, uh, well, seven minutes uh, break. Uh, and you will be redirected to the uh, group depending on the track that you chose. All right, so see you, see you in seven minutes. Please don't be late. Thank <laughs> you. 